Bye, Mr. Drew. In this video, we're going to do four examples of finding limits using properties of limits. Uh, not the numerical approach where we do a t-table, not a graphical approach where we make a bunch of graphs, uh, which can be tedious and monotonous and be actually sometimes required. But these questions that we do in this video are going to work out using the properties. Now, <clears throat> let's not forget that, say this first example here. We're going to find the limit as x approaches 3, becomes infinitely close to 3. Now, remember a two-sided limit, which this is because I don't have a plus or minus uh, written in the exponent. Uh, there's no negative sign, so I'm not coming in at 3 from the left. And there's no positive sign, so I'm not just coming in from 3 to the right. It's just the limit as x approaches 3. So this is a two-sided limit. And for a two-sided limit to exist, the graph must approach the same y value from both the left and the right-hand side. Now, <clears throat> We don't need to, with these problems, we're not going to need to check both the left and right hand limit because, well, look what we're taking. We're taking the limit of x squared minus 4x plus 7. This is a polynomial. This is a, actually, this is a parabola with the one squared term. So parabolas are smooth and continuous and defined basically for all real numbers. So this graph, I understand, is going to be a smooth, continuous graph. When I, so when I let the, uh, the x value approach 3, which in this problem, let's be honest, we'll be able to just plug in 3. We just learned that in the previous video, properties of limits. Um, we're not just plugging in 3. We're not just finding the values, the function's value at 3. We're finding the limit as x approaches 3. Now, sometimes it's going to be look, it's going to look like I'm just finding the function's value, and indeed, because a parabola is defined and smooth and continuous everywhere within its domain, the limit will be the function's value. But you'll see some examples in this video where uh, the limit is not equal to the function's value, or the left and right hand limit are not equal. Usually, the left and right hand limit are not equal when you're dealing with a piecewise function. So I'm going to do a separate video uh, of just finding limits of piecewise functions. OK, enough of the introduction. Let's do these examples. The limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus 4x plus 7. Well, this again, like I just said, was a polynomial. And we just learned to find the limit of a polynomial. All we do need to do is take that value of a and plug it into the function. So we're going to have 3 squared minus 4 times 3 plus 7. 3 squared is 9. Negative 4 times 3 is negative 12 plus uh, 7. 9 and 7 make 16. And 16 minus 12 is equal to 4. So, indeed, this function's value at 3 is 4. And if you, you know, just graph it for your own personal uh, you know, learning, you will see that the graph will approach 3 from the left and approach 3 from the right. I'm not sure if it's going to be going this way or this way. But it is going to approach the y value of 4 from uh, both sides, left of 3 and right of 3. Over here, we have another uh, function. It's a little bit different because of the square root symbol. So we want to find the limit as x approaches negative 2 of the square root of x squared plus 12. Well, we are going to use that property of uh, roots, which says that we can basically just apply the limit function to the, well, what is a polynomial inside the square root function. This entire expression is not a polynomial because of, um, well, the square root symbol. So we're going to take the square root of the limit as x approaches negative 2 of x squared plus 12. Now, just looking at x squared plus 12 again, forgetting the square root temporarily, the limit of x squared plus 12, this is a binomial or a polynomial, uh, all real coefficients, uh, whole number exponents. So we're going to go ahead and just plug in that negative 2. And let's see what we have. The square root of negative 2 squared plus 12. Please note that I'm using a set of parentheses around that negative 2. You should always use parentheses when substituting uh, numerical values into an expression or actually even algebraic ones. You should always use parentheses when you substitute. And in case, you know, I know you're studying calculus, but just in case you forgot, negative 2 squared is equal to negative 4, whereas negative 2 squared is equal to positive 4. Exponents only act on what they're sitting on. So if you're sloppy with your work and you don't include those parentheses around those negative numbers, if you do it in your head, you might be OK. But if you're using a graphing calculator or a two-line scientific, it'll know the proper syntax. And if you put the wrong syntax, that's the way you type it in, if you put the wrong uh, 
syntax into your calculator, it will give you <laughs> the correct answer, even if though uh, it's not really what you wanted or expected. So use those parentheses when you substitute. So negative 2 squared is 4. So it's going to be the square root of 4 plus 12, which is equal to the square root of 16, which is equal to 4. So this function, is, if you were to graph this, y equals or f of x equals square root of x squared plus 12, as you approach negative 2 from the left and from the right, you are going to, on both sides, have a left and a right limit equal to 4. Thus, the two-sided limit is equal to 4. Last four examples, we're all going to deal with quotients because that's really one of the biggest issues when trying to find limits, uh, the problems that are cause you to think the most and have to do the most work to find those limits because we all know you can't divide by zero. All right, so here we have those quotients, or at least two of the four. The limit as x approaches 3 of 4x minus 15 over 2x minus uh, 3. Now, <clears throat> Just a quick check, if I take 3 and I plug it into the denominator, I'm going to get 6 minus 3. So actually this is going to be the most straightforward quotient example I'm going to do because when I try and find the limit as x approaches 3, this function, this quotient is not going to be undefined. Thus, um, I should not have a problem finding the limit at x equals 3. It should be approaching the same y value from both the left and right hand side. Uh, <clears throat> as you saw when you I keep referring to that, but I'm, I'm making you thinking about when we, um, or trying to make you think about when we found limits using the numerical uh, method t tables and the graphing techniques, where you actually looked at the graph and you saw, you know, an approach in a hole from the left to right hand side or something like that. So, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, we can take the limit using the property of quotients. We can do the limit as x approaches 3 of 4x minus 15 over the limit as x approaches 3 of 2x minus 3. Now if I take the limit, you know, use the property of quo the, the quotient property to apply the limit function to both the numerator and denominator, the numerator is a polynomial, uh, the denominator is just a polynomial, so I'm just going to be able to plug in uh, the value of 3 and get our overall limit. So we have 4 times 3 minus 15 over 2 times 3 minus 3, that's going to be 12 minus 15 over 6 minus 3. That comes out to be negative 3 over 3, so my limit, as x approaches 3, this quotient is going to approach the y value of negative 1. And because this is actually defined at the value, the x value, or the, excuse me, the a value of 3, this is actually the function's uh, value as well, but we'll be testing for continuity and discontinuity in the next section, the next video um, that we do. So here we have the limit as x approaches negative 1 of 2x squared minus x minus 3 over x minus 1. If I try and take the negative 1 and plug it into the denominator, I will be dividing by 0. So this, this fraction is undefined at the value of negative 1. And I don't want to do a t-table, and I don't want to do a graph to find the limit. I don't want to, you know, to find the y value as x approaches negative 1. I want to do it using the properties of limits. So, we're going to factor, and hopefully factor into the numerator and the denominator, if there was really any need for that, it's only x plus 1, and see if I can get the denominator to cancel out. Or, you know, somehow algebraic, algebraically manipulate this fraction to get a new expression <clears throat> that I can plug the value of negative 1 in and actually get the limit. So the numerator, 2x squared minus x minus 3. If I take the leading coefficient and the constant and multiply those together, I'm going to do a little scratch work here. I get negative 6. I get a product of negative 6. Are there factors of negative 6 that will add to the middle term of negative 1? Well, I have factors of, you know, uh, 6 and negative 1, negative 1 and 6, uh, 2 and negative 3, and negative 2. I've lost track of what I just said. But I want a set of factors of negative 6 that add to the middle term of negative 1. And indeed, that's actually what I used to get 
you know, this product. This is a technique of, of factoring trinomials that have a leading coefficient that are greater than one. You don't have to do trial and error if that's the way you were taught. So I want to take the leading coefficient and the constant, multiply them together, find factors of this that add to the middle term, and indeed, 2 plus negative 3 do equal negative 1, the middle term. And I'm going to rewrite this uh, numerator temporarily and do some scratch work on the side to get it factored. So we have 2x squared plus 2x minus 3x minus 3. Now, 2 minus 3 is negative 1. So I'm not changing the value of this polynomial. I'm just making it look different. And again, leading coefficient, constant, multiply them together, find factors that add to the middle term. You want to rewrite that middle term using those factors. And then I'm going to factor this by grouping. Uh, these first two terms have a 2 and an x in them. So 2x. 2x squared divided by 2x is x. 2x divided by 2x is 1. I want to take something out of the last two terms. These both have a factor of negative 3, so I'm going to factor that out. And I've done my, fact, my uh, factoring by grouping properly. If I get the same group, the same you know, expression in both of my parentheses, the x minus 1, so, or plus 1. So now I have two terms. They're complicated, but the parentheses are locking everything together. I have two terms. Uh, that are being subtracted together and both have a factor of x plus 1. So the x plus 1 comes out, and this divided by x plus 1 is 2x, and we have minus 3 over here. Well, uh, you know, this leading coefficient and the constant, they're prime, so uh, you probably already knew the answer before I was halfway done with this process, but this little technique of factoring is nice, especially when these leading coefficient and constants get to be a little bit larger and have a lot more different possible sets of factors. So this becomes the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x plus 1 times 2x minus 3 over um, x minus 1. And we're going to cancel out that x plus 1. What does that mean? That means graphically this function, you know, if we were to graph this expression or, you know, f of x equals this function, if we were to graph that, this function, which is undefined at negative 1, we're now seeing that we're able to cancel out that denominator of x plus 1. If you did hopefully uh, do that section about finding limits graphically, you would know that there is a hole in the graph at the value of the a value of negative 1. So we're going to find the limit as x approaches negative 1 of 2x minus 3. So what is left is just a line. Uh, basically f of x equals or y equals mx plus b. So if you were to graph this, it would be a line with a hole in it. Whenever you have a hole in a graph, your graph, your function is going to, unless it's a piecewise function, is more than likely going to approach that hole, the same y value from both the left and the right. So we can basically just take this negative 1, plug it in. Negative 2 minus 3 is negative 5. And um, that's my answer. That's the limit as x approaches negative 1 is negative 5. We've got two more examples. I'm going to do one you know, example at a time because they're going to take a little bit of work. So here we have an example. Limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over x plus 8 minus 1 over 8 over x. Lots of fractions in this problem. And of course, the biggest issue is when I try and take the value of 0, a, the a value of 0, and plug it in, my limit becomes undefined. So Hopefully, with some algebraic uh, manipulation, uh, working on this fraction, we can get another expression. has the same you know, value, but just looks different. Uh, another expression where I can plug in that value of 0. Well, with our problem here, <clears throat> at least we have some algebra we can see that we need to do. It's a very complicated quotient. It's fractions that need to be added on top. It's a fraction over a fraction. So we're going to go ahead and find common denominators. Simplify the numerator and denominator if there were a need to. And then we're going to flip that bottom up. So we're going to take this uh, fraction here, this second fraction in the numerator. We're going to multiply it by x plus 8 in the numerator and denominator. We're finding, we're finding common denominators. We're going to add those two fractions on top. Multiply this first, this first fraction 
by 8, <clears throat> and we get the limit as x approaches 0 of, let's see here, we have 8 times 1 is 8, minus, I'm going to put those fractions together as I do this to save some, some uh, writing space, negative. Now, I'm going to use a set of parentheses here because I have a binomial. I will have a binomial in the numerator of the second fraction, and if I don't use parentheses, I will not remember to take that minus sign here that's between the fractions and distribute it through, and that would be a problem. I uh, get the answer wrong. So we have 8 from this numerator, minus here, parentheses, x plus 8. I'm not going to distribute, I should need to have another set of parentheses there, I'm not going to distribute together uh, the denominator that I'm going to have the common denominator I'm going to create, because hopefully it's going to do some kind of canceling, you know, somewhere. Uh, I don't want to miss an opportunity or make anything harder to identify any kind of cancellations to make sure that I do get that denominator that's not undefined at the next value of zero. So I'm going to leave it eight times x plus eight, and then the denominator is just x. Okay, well, if I take this negative sign and distribute it to the negative one, really, distribute it through the parentheses and combine like terms, I'm going to have negative x and then negative 8. So I'm going to have 8 minus 8, which is going to be 0. So I've got the limit as x approaches 0 of, well, negative x over 8 times x plus 8 over x. Now, when I make that x in the denominator, I'm going to make it look like a fraction, or just you know show that it really kind of is. It's you know has a denominator of one. To remind you that we have a fraction divided by a fraction. When you have a fraction divided by another fraction, you need to change that division and flip the second fraction. When you divide fractions, you actually multiply by the reciprocal of the second fraction. That's that denominator. So we're going to change that division to multiplication by flipping the bottom fraction up and multiplying by the reciprocal. So, we get the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x over 8 times x minus 8, no, plus 8, times, flip it up, 1 over x. Those x's are going to cancel out, leaving us with just a negative 1 in the numerator. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this again, save a little bit of writing space, and just be lazy. Uh, x negative, uh, x divided by x is negative 1. So this is going to become negative 1. So we're going to take the limit of the numerator and the limit of the denominator separately and divide them. So the limit as x approaches 0 of negative 1 divided by the limit as x approaches 0 of 8 times x plus 8. <clears throat> well, this is just a constant, so the limit of a constant is that value itself. Here we have, I could probably actually distribute that 8 now and see that it's a polynomial, but I'm just going to be able to take that 0 and plug it in. So we get negative 1 over, taking the 0 and plugging it in, we have 8 times 0 plus 8. And our overall limit is going to be negative 1 16th. Next example. It's a thing to stop. Uh, camera. <clears throat> How about before I erase this and do the next example, uh, I remember that uh, 8 times 8 is uh, <laughs> 64. <laughs> I did 8 plus 8, obviously. Okay, now we're done. Woo! So here we have our last example. Uh, the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of 9 plus x minus 3 over x. This process has done enough in calculus. I'm probably going to just post this example as a separate, very short video. So if you happen to see Rationalizing the Numerator uh, and you've already watched this video, don't, don't watch it again. Because I'm going to do the same example. I'm just going to repost it. So we have the limit as x approaches 0 of square root of 9 plus x minus 3 over x. To just make this kind of question up and you know just randomly pick numbers and have it work out, most of the time it won't. So uh, you might have to find the limit either numerically or graphically. But when you go to find something called a derivative, and that, you know, that process of finding derivative, uh, and it's finding the instantaneous slope of a curved line, uh, or the finding the slope of a curved line at any given point, this is not an unlikely or uncommon process. And with those type of questions, of course, it's going to work. 
So we go to try and plug in zero, it becomes undefined in the denominator. So what are we going to do? Again, without drawing a picture or doing it with a t table, doing it numerically. Well, what we're going to do is rationalize the numerator, which is something that we're, math teachers have been telling you for like what, 10, 11 years now? Like, you know, rationalize the denominator. I do not want the square root in the denominator. I want the final answer uh, with, it, with no radical in the denominator. Well, now we're going to do just the opposite, not because I'm trying to write a final answer, but because I can't find the limit, at least not using the properties of limits. So we're going to multiply the numerator and denominator by the square root of 9 plus x plus 3. We're going, to, we're going to multiply by the conjugate, where we have basically like a minus b times a plus b, which verbally saying it that way, you might recognize that this is a pattern for factoring a difference of squares. And what's cool about multiplying by the conjugate is the middle term that you would normally get when you multiply two binomials is going to cancel out. So this is going to be the limit as x approaches 0 of, let's see here, square root of 9 plus x times the square root of 9 plus x. When we multiply square roots and they're identical, they just, the square root just cancels out. So we're going to have 9 plus x. And then square root of 9 plus x times 3 is going to be plus 3 square root of 9 plus x. And then negative 3 times square root of 9 plus x. And then negative 3 times positive 3, which is negative 9 over our denominator, which I'm just not going to put together. We're just going to leave it x times the square root of 9 plus x plus 3. Now, why am I resisting uh, multiplying that together? Because it is the x in the denominator that's making this fraction undefined at the value of 0. So hopefully when we're done with this process, it cancels out. Well, <clears throat> the 3 square root of blah, 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 minus 3 square root of blah, blah, blah. They're going to cancel out. And we have 9 minus 9, which is also going to cancel out, leaving us with the numerator uh, just having a value of 0. So let's pick a different color and cancel those 9's out. And now we have just the value of x, or just the x term left on the numerator. Well, uh, I'm tempted to just cancel it out. but Try to make sure you guys see what I'm doing. So blah, 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 just x on top. Down the bottom, we have x times the square root, or parentheses, square root of 9 plus x plus 3. We can see that those x's cancel out, leaving me with just a 1 on the top. So we have the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of 9 plus x plus 3. That is going to become 1 over, we're going to plug in the value of 0 now, so 1 over the square root of 9 plus 0 plus 3, that becomes 1 over the square root of 9 plus 0 is 9, the square root of 9 is 3 plus 3 which is 1 6. Let me just check my notes. That's it. I'm Mr. Taru. Go to your home.